Welcome to the Korean Art Podcast. I'm your host, Jed Lee Henry, and on today's show we have Balaj Shalantai. Balaj is a professor of history at Korea University, and the author of Kim Il-sung in the Khrushchev era, and Caught in Time, Images of War and Reconstruction. But for today's podcast, we're going to focus on a series of articles that he has written. Some of the research overlaps with these books, but it is a fresh look at history, and also the present moment. Now, the Korean War is one of those moments that has long been played out in history books. It is often referred to as the Forgotten War, but this is just for people outside of the field. People uninterested in the topic itself. Closer to home, of course, there is a much keener interest in this. And Balaj comes to this from a different angle. He looks inside the minds of either side, the propaganda battles that they've been fighting since the war, and tries to look in on questions of reconciliation and responsibility from both sides. Our South Korea was transitioning into a full democracy. Those early presidential candidates, once in power, began implementing truth and reconciliation commissions. Ways to look back on the authoritarian era, tackle those difficult memories that people have, seek out the reality of what actually happened on the ground, and this was all done so under the idea that this was the only way in which a country could ever heal properly from this sort of trauma. And of course this stretches back all the way to the Korean War, and to the moments before that, to the crackdowns and suppressions under Sung Man Rhee. And in the South, a certain phenomena has held true. The further that Southern politicians get away from atrocities by virtue of time, the more willing they are to look back critically at these moments and open up the idea of revising history, or at least looking at it through a new lens. However, in North Korea, the opposite has been true. In those early moments of the Korean War, and just afterwards, surprisingly, Kim Il-sung was willing, at least in some ways, to be critical of the behavior of his regime. He called out northern soldiers for their excesses and the military command for its failure to take proper care of civilians. Now, of course, there's an aspect of theater about all this, but it was public and this was the regime criticizing itself. And yet, if this was a hopeful moment, that was all there was. The further removed from these moments North Korea has become, the more unlikely they have been to go back and allow any sort of critical analysis. Instead, they've taken a view towards history of this kind that involves blaming an outside power, almost exclusively America, excusing the South under the guise that they are a puppet or pawns of the American forces. And this was also they could paint a picture of the Korean War that was non-fratricidal. This couldn't be a conflict in which Koreans fought Koreans, or indeed Koreans invaded Koreans. This had to be the work and the stoking of foreign intervention. And of course, there are a number of reasons for this not least of which is the idea of political legitimacy. That inside North Korea, the current leaders hold at least some of their right to rule as a form of inheritance. If you begin to go back and question the grandfather and the origins of the North Korean state, then you also by definition begin to question the authority of the son and now the grandson. And this becomes a great platform to look at the question of denuclearization, at least in terms of international comparisons. Balaj goes out and analyzes the other cases of historical denuclearization. Taiwan, Argentina, Libya, Brazil, even South Korea. But he centers around the most applicable reference point being that of South Africa. He sees similarities in the nature of their external security situation. Similarities in the need of the regime to maintain absolute authority and legitimacy inside its borders. Similarity in the nature of each side's individual military buildup and also within the international sanctions pressure that was applied to both countries. There is significant crossover here between the two countries in these terms. Now there is also significant differences, places where the example begins to break down, often centering around the collapse at the time of the apartheid regime and the level of development inside the nuclear and missile program. And with this understanding of history, memory, reconciliation, rehabilitation in the bank, Balaj will then look forward to the present moment talk through what possibilities, if any, there is for a denuclearization agreement, and indeed, importantly, a change in North Korea's stance towards the outside world. Now, as always, this podcast is entirely funded by you, the listener. And if you do want it to continue, please consider donating at the Patreon account or the PayPal link attached below. Alternatively, you can simply share this podcast, like it, or comment on it across social media. All the help is appreciated. On that, and to talk us through questions of memory, reconciliation, and responsibility regarding the Korean War and the denuclearization process, this is Balaj Salante. Balaj Salante, welcome to the Korean Now podcast. Uh, Thank you so much for your invitation. 
So we're going to be looking through a number of different aspects of your research today. No, by no means all of them. You've got a much larger body of work than this, but we're going to touch on some of the your work concerning uh, memory and reconciliation and the Korean War and uh, denuclearization. So um, the first article we're going to touch on today is one that you've written called uh, Captives of Captives of the Past, Questions of Responsibility and Reconciliation in North Korea's Narratives of the Korean War. And this is a fascinating look into how either side in this conflict has remembered or failed to remember or have chosen to remember differently uh, some of this traumatic event of the past. And uh, of course, many people will know that there is a different understanding on either side here in how they view this conflict. Either side thinking the other one started it. And that is the real crux of this. Not so much the conflict that this was bad enough, but who kicked things off? And we have had access in recent decades to the old communist archives, which have, if there were doubts in anyone's mind, they should have dispelled all this. We now have access to the internal minds of Stalin and Mao and the discussions with Kim Il-sung. But there is still this dispute, this change. And over the years, South Korea has, because it's become more liberal and less authoritarian, has been more willing to look at itself and ask difficult questions about the past and change how it has seen its behavior in the war. But North Korea has been stuck in this mold and has refuses to shift. So I might get you to start by looking at this question as an overview here of the Korean War, this idea of memory, why either side uh, comes from it in such, such different directions, and why, if at all, this matters at all. Oh, uh, yeah, thanks a lot. It's definitely something very important and interesting. Because, as you pointed out, in South Korea, there has been a gradual re-examination of the war narratives that uh, to recognize that not only 100% it was one responsibility from North Korea, it was at least partly a sort of shared responsibility, partly by the United States, partly by South Korean authorities themselves. So it's a more complex narrative, but at the same time also politically polarized because some political parties and groups are, of course, more interested in critically re-examining the role of Lee Sin Man, for example. And other political groups feel that this kind of criticism is somehow negative. But still, because, as you pointed out, all this appeared in the context of democratization, so there was a possibility and also a kind of like uh, initiative to do it. In North Korea, with the political system being more or less intact in, in this respect, there was absolutely very little reason or no reason at all to see the war in a different light. However, North Korea, North Korea, for all the concerns that people have uh, about as the things that you've just mentioned there, they do understand the principle, at least in that pure theoretical sense, of addressing problems of the past. Because for a number of years now, they have focused on Tokyo. Of course, this is, uh, goes back to the Japanese period when the Japanese occupied Korea as a whole, and then the war period itself. And they have focused on trying to call Tokyo to account so that they can uh, at least recognize these crimes of the past and apologize and even compensate for them. Oh, yeah. It's very much the issue that uh, who is the guilty side, because definitely uh, to admit that in any sense, North Korea was also responsible for the conflict. It would have been an extremely difficult problem for North Korea in terms of political legitimacy. Because we may make here some comparison with, say, the Soviet Union under Stalin and Khrushchev. When Stalin died, and a few years later, Khrushchev made his famous secret speech, he definitely and very clearly accused Stalin not only of domestic repression, but also of really badly mismanaging the war, of disregarding warnings and therefore exposing the country to the German attack. So he definitely used this issue of Stalin's war responsibility to delegitimize Stalin. So he had a kind of very strong political stake 
in doing that because by building up his own authority, he could do it in an effective way by like undermining the kind of artificial legitimacy of Stalin. Very similar a bit to the situation in China when Deng Xiaoping built up his own power by criticizing Mao. But in North Korea, when power was inherited first by Kim Jong-il, then by Kim Jong-un, it would have been very, very counterproductive to say that the founder of the dynasty did make something grievously wrong and this exposed the country to a catastrophe. And that might also add towards the explanation of, of the sort of time periods in which either side has been willing to address these sort of, I suppose the word is error or, or in some ways atrocities of the past. As time has gone by, South Korea has shown itself to be more and more willing to address historical problems like this. And as time has gone by, North Korea has become more and more reticent because um, a lot of your research has been this fascinating deep look in those early years of uh, the DPRK. And in those early years, during the war itself, um, Kim Il-sung did occasionally call out his own cadres, call out his own people inside the regime and criticize them publicly for some of their seizure of property and some of their behavior in those very early moments. Yeah, actually, it was really kind of necessary because after the Chinese troops pushed Americans back and North Korea reestablished its authority over the territory of the DPRK, it really faced the problem that during this brief period of US and South Korean occupation, at least a substantial part of the population like wanted to find some sort of other political alter alternatives to express opposition to the regime. So it means that a substantial part of our population turned out to be disloyal. So reacting to this uh, situation, uh, the regime really went into overdrive that they like persecuted such a huge number of so-called collaborators that eventually it started to undermine the regime itself. So then they decided to stop it. And in a kind of very typical way, they blamed it on somebody else, not on Kim Il-sung himself. So they picked uh, Hokai, who was the highest ranking Soviet Korean in the apparat, like second or third most important person after Kim Il-sung. So it was a kind of credible and at least partly justified decision. But of course, it was very unfair to put the blame only on subordinates and completely absolving Kim Il-sung. So ever since that, this was this general modus operandi of the regime. If anything goes wrong, blame it on somebody else, never on the supreme leader. But after it was settled, because it, they had to react to this immediate crisis, they were really very much unwilling to mention anything about these unpleasant memories because we wanted to establish the narrative that we were the good side and the enemy was the bad. So admitting anything about our mistakes would have been really politically counterproductive. And uh, you've just mentioned there the idea that North Korea were incredibly focused on this idea of uh, blaming somebody else for these challenges. And uh, despite being in a war ostensibly between the North and the South Korea, this is a civil war, they were also incredibly keen not to blame the South Koreans. They just This is when the, the hatred for America, or at least America as a scapegoat for a lot of problems, became really came into the fore. So you have these moments such as the, um, the Sinjon Massacre. And if for people familiar, this is what uh, the, um, is mentioned in the famous novel, The Guest. And uh, this is a massacre inside North Korea, and the North Korean narrative blames it almost entirely on Americans. But of course, this was North Koreans killing North Koreans. But even when it was not, even when it was South Koreans and North Koreans fighting each other, um, there's always an attempt inside North Korea to, to downplay this and to upgrade and upplay the idea of American involvement here. Yeah, this really goes back to the very early period, immediately to 1951 that I just very recently read a manuscript by another scholar and 
hopefully it will be published, which mentioned a visit of a foreign delegation from the a kind of, uh, you know, global communist oriented uh, women's organization, which con conducted a sort of investigation of war crimes in North Korea during the war in like first half of 1951. And they, of course, definitely could see with their own eyes that the Americans bombed everything. So it was very clear. But then they were also given access to places like Xinjiang. And the North Korean authorities showed them a lot of like remains of these types of massacres. What was interesting, and the author also very aptly pointed out, that as you also said, many of these massacres were committed by Koreans, either by local North Koreans, sometimes by South Koreans. But then during the whole uh, kind of so-called investigation, the North Koreans invariably always, always blamed only the Americans, sometimes a little bit the British but always the foreigners. Never they mentioned Korean atrocities. And one interesting reason of why they did it this was that after this organization committed the investigation, it sent a long report to the UN. And they said that, see, this is why you should withdraw all foreign troops, meaning the UN troops from Korea, because the foreign troops commit the, all these atrocities and massacres. So this helps a bit to understand why North Korea did not mention that it was partly our own people killing each other, because it would be more like handy to blame it on completely on the foreign imperialist invaders, because then we can use it as an argument that they should be withdrawn. But to say that, well, we killed each other would be really not suitable for this purpose. And uh, for that purpose, the idea of saying that um, it is a foreign problem here and therefore foreign troops should be withdrawn, it means North Korea were very keen to blame a lot of these these war massacres, etc., on, um, on American involvement. But over the years, they have also shown willingness through the authoritarian years in South Korea to at least highlight some of the human rights abuses inside South Korea. Now, this seems to be that they were doing this as a way to say, once again, these South Koreans are puppets of America and therefore these atrocities come about. But um, as the, um, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Korea came about, the North Koreans followed this quite, quite closely and they were very keen to focus on these human rights abuses, if only to say um, this is a now puppet regime and uh, once again we should get rid of the foreign troops and foreign influence. Yeah, definitely, because it was kind of very useful as a sort of delegitimizing not only the old regimes, but also those South Korean political parties which were emotionally or directly connected to these older governments, like, you know, the Grand National Party, later called Senuridang. So the conservatives were all is kind of more like reluctant to speak about the atrocities of the authoritarian regime. So this was a kind of handy way to like corner them and expose them as people unwilling to admit the shameful past. But still it was very interesting that if we compare the attention, relative attention, which North Korean propaganda paid to these exposed atrocities by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and to the exposed uh, killings by Americans, like, for example, the Nogunri massacre of refugees, then North Korea devoted much more attention to criticizing the Americans than to South Korean perpetrators, which was, in a sense, very paradoxical because if we count it in numbers, that we can say that in the first months of the war, when South Korean troops were pushed back, then the police of Lee Sin Man definitely killed much more people than the Americans killed deliberately and Nogunri and elsewhere. But still, 
for North Korean uh, propaganda, it was much more convenient to put uh, the blame mostly on the Americans, partly on the logic that, well, listen, money is gone, but the uh, U.S. troops are still here and we want them to get out. And this focus on America, is it simply an internal propaganda play uh, to strengthen the regime and to once again legitimize, uh, legitimize the rulers themselves? Or is there a, a, a deeper political purpose here, even if it's just financial? I mean, over the years, um, North Korea have not been shy about asking Japan, not just for apology, but also for compensation. But I, as far as I can see, this doesn't seem to have been the stretch towards America. Have North Korea been seeking this sort of apology and compensation from America over the years as well? I think they consider it very hopeless. I mean, it's kind of impossible to raise this issue that way. But there was definitely a foreign policy focus in the sense that very much the issue is addressed towards South Korea. South Korean public opinion, because honestly speaking, they have better chance to operate with a sort of nationalist propaganda when they want to influence South Korean population than to speak about Juche Sasang, Juche idea, because it's terribly boring stuff and actually <laughs> just tautological. It doesn't say anything basically and repeats the nothing every time. So to make any impact on the population, you must appeal on some sort of populist sentiments. And anti-Japanese nationalism is one thing, Korean unity is other thing, anti-Americanism is a third thing. So this was one other motive for hammering on this issue that it was the Americans who did the worst things because it would create theoretically a sort of potential consensus between us and South Korea as to bring us together. So is this an attempt, at least in part, to s separate South Korea from America from the South Korean perspectives themselves? So it, um, th this focus that you've been talking about sounds an awful lot like um, North Korea saying, despite the harms that were done in the war, this should not be a barrier to reconciliation. The only barrier to reconciliation between our two countries is the presence of the people that started the war in their mind, America. So are they trying to send a message to South Korea that um, the only barrier towards uh, a peaceful future, uh, re reconciliation, maybe reunification, is just the presence of those Americans and therefore us Koreans can fix this problem as we should? Well, this is definitely one of the strongest messages. It doesn't necessarily mean that this is what they really think, but it's very convenient that for them to put the blame on the Americans. I can tell some anecdote from the 1970s which tells very clearly that this is very much done in a kind of deliberate way in some sort of even blatant disregard of the effects. And that in the 70s there was an East European delegation visiting North Korea and they were also given a DMZ tour as so many times it would happen to foreign visitors. So they were brought to the border and the North Korean guide uh, pointed over the border to the other zone and pointed some soldiers there and said, look at the American imperialists, they are the responsible for dividing our country. Pointed directly at them, the soldiers in question were standing just a few dozen meters away, so everybody with two eyes in his head could see that they were actually not American, but South Korean soldiers. And you don't really expect a North Korean guy, North Korean guy, you know, not to know the difference between a South Korean and the American soldier. But the narrative was that it's the Americans and we basically ignore the South Koreans because they don't exist just as puppets of the Americans. But it doesn't mean that the regime, the leadership in its mind, back in its mind, did not recognize the fact that we also have a serious problem with South Korean elites and population, which have rather different interests and desires not to live under our leadership. 
But to say it openly, admit it openly, is not so convenient. It's much better to put the blame on the foreign enemy. And does this go some way to explaining why, during the sunshine years when uh, Kim Dae Young came to power, North Korea weren't as open and receptive to him as people expected him, that's, expected the Northern regime to be? Um, this was a a very open-handed reconciliatory reconciliatory government coming into power that had an idea of simply reaching out to the North without any preconditions and that the idea that we can become, we can build on friendship and build on reconciliation and then we can worry about all these other issues of human rights and uh, and denuclearization down the line. In many ways, an incredibly uh, uh, open way to reach across the aisle, but they were received quite poorly in 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 Pyongyang. Their rhetoric didn't really ease off. And from reading your work here, it seems to be that the rhetoric may not have eased off and that all these accusations kept flying at the South and at flying at Kim Dae-yong because they sensed in him an unwillingness still to break away from America. Yeah, indeed. It was very characteristic in this sense also that, that how... South Korean relationship with Japan were thrown into the picture because, see, when Kim Dae Jung took over, it was just a period of the financial crisis. So Korea badly needed some sort of external financial resources. And so when Kim Dae Jung visited Japan, he really made strong efforts to normalize relationship with the Japanese government. And one element of this policy was that Kim Dae Jung made a fishing agreement with Japan, which basically allowed the joint use of the sea in the disputed area around Dokdo, which Japanese prefer to call Takashima. So, because Kim Dae Jung realized that if we insist that it's ours and the Japanese insist it's theirs, then nothing is going to be solved ever. So better to have a sort of joint use. And this was a very paradoxical situation because the conservative opposition, the uh, Grand National Party, they condemned their fishing agreement as sort of sellout. And North Korea also very badly criticized it, that saying it, it's like selling out our national land and all that which was very paradoxical because just a year before, when the dispute over Dokdo was really at a high pitch between the previous administration, Kim Jong-sam and uh, Japan, then North Korea said absolutely nothing about the whole issue as it did not exist. But now when Kim Dae-jung tried to make a deal with Japan to defuse the situation, they immediately started to accuse him that now he's like, committing a sellout. So it was very clear that in the North Korean logic, you are kind of uh, like acceptable as a friend moving toward closer cooperation if you are willing to keep a distance from Japan, from United States, preferably from both. So there is a another aspect in this that we haven't quite touched on yet, and this is the idea that North Korea may have, over time, been unwilling to um, revise their, their, their view on history of the Korean War because of who they fought with and particularly their, their um, alliance with China. Now, this is famously the, the alliance-sealed, uh, the, the blood-sealed friendship. And um, over the years, uh, if... North Korea were ever willing, if for whatever reason, to re-examine their their relationship with the war, it would also re-examine China's relationship. Now, I mentioned before those, uh, the opening of the old communist archives, and they have shown China not just um, engaging in the war in a much larger way than they have claimed to have, but also have, have assisted in the planning for the war as well. But... Um, over the years, of course, if North Korea uh, change how they see this, they also have to change China's role in this. China is not so much the defender, the the protector of North Korea, but also, but now suddenly the potentially the perpetrator of an invasion, or at least the moral support or the diplomatic backup to an invasion. And I didn't realize this until reading your work here. But even inside China today, the official textbooks read that uh, it was not it was the south and america that started the war and not north korea yeah indeed it's kind 
kind of very like characteristic that just a few years ago uh, there, there was a, a film or I think rather a film series made in China which covered at least partly the period of the Korean War or even directly focused on that. And this still maintained the narrative that China did something what was right, that we had to help North Korea against the like American enemy because we did the right thing for our national security and also for loyalty toward the friend. So if we look at the whole so, sort of pro propaganda of the uh, Chinese concept of like peaceful rise, it is very much uh, based on the concept that China was not only in recent times, but kind of historically a peaceful great power, that it was always the foreign enemies picking up conflicts and we were not a country like the imperialist empires. So to admit that China historically got on the wrong side on, of the UN of doing some sort of support to an aggression against a foreign country, this would look very bad. It is easier to admit that Mao did bad things in domestic politics and the new leaders corrected it than to admit that the country the state as such uh, got on the wrong side in an international conflict. So China is not going to admit that. Korea would it admit, but even this is a difficult thing because as you mentioned, the relationship between North Korea and China. During the war, American and South Korean propaganda depicted Kim Il-sung and North Korea as a sort of puppet regime of China, that Kim Il-sung is feeding the Chinese soldiers at the expense of the starving North Korean population, that he is like just a marionette of the Russians and the Chinese. So as a reaction to it, more and more North Korean propaganda started to build up the narrative that mostly the war was fought by us and China played a very little limited role in that. Uh, there is a, another aspect here, another particular reason why North Korea may not be able to um, revise their past in this way. And I know you have a slightly different uh, view on this to what you originally wrote in your article as well, so I might get you to introduce that as well. But there is an idea here that um, because the, the legitimacy of Kim Jong-il and now Kim Jong-un is predicated back to Kim, jo uh, Kim Il-sung, the grandfather, um, they can't revise history. So in some way, this is how the theory goes, that the grandfather was such an incredible character that he ruled by his own uh, legitimacy, despite having his lineage traced all the, all the way back to Tangun. But uh, since which the son and now the grandson, in some ways their right to rule is based on le the legitimacy of the grandfather. And if you start changing the grandfather's history and saying perhaps things weren't as great as we as we thought they were, it may uh, it may ch a challenge or erode the current uh, rule of the of at least Kim Jong Un today. Oh yeah, this is definitely the case because here uh, there is actually something I would like to correct a little bit in my own previous publication because. I wrote it in the period when Kim uh, Jong-un just came to power, or very recently that he was dead. So my assumption was that his legitimacy must be based mostly on his, like, you know, heritage that having inherited power from his father and then from his grandfather, because unlike Kim Jong-il, he was not really prepared for this role long in advance. It was really abrupt, partly brought upon by the stroke of Kim Jong-il that really a successor must have been produced immediately. So they trust him into th this role and he had to grow into it very quickly. So my assumption was, was that, well, he did get the legitimacy mostly from the, you know, parent and grandparent. But later I saw when they gradually build up his image that I was mistaken in that, that the regime doesn't work like a kind of classical dynasty in Japan or China or 
Korea because there uh, the legitimacy of a leader is based very much on a sort of ritualized, uh, constant institutional continuity. But here they want to build up a, an individual personality, an individual style, individual characteristic for each regime, each leader. They want to maintain the continuity through, but at the same time, they really want to show that every leader is also able and completely fit for the role, not only because he is the son of somebody else. So in this sense, I was a kind of mistaken, but it's still definitely true that for the regime, it would be very bad policy to admit that we ever did anything wrong as a family. Because in this sense, it's really interesting that the North Korean leadership's legitimacy is really like different from the classical communist regime. Because the legitimacy of somebody like Stalin or Mao was based on the concept that they are the best pupils of somebody else, that Stalin learned from Lenin, Lenin learned from Marx and Engels. And so there is a sort of like theoretical base upon which their position is based. But North Korea eventually uh, created a situation that almost everything before Kim Il-sung was tabula rasa, that he came from nothing and then he created did everything by himself. So in this situation, you really cannot skip Kim Il-sung because if you skip him, then you have the abyss before you. So it would be extremely counterproductive for them to say anything to slight him. And if he was generally and good in everything, that he must have been good in the war as well. So let's uh, talk about the other side of this dilemma. This is South Korea, of course. Now, they have come to this in a very different way. As I mentioned earlier, they, um, at least in the early authoritarian years, were incredibly reluctant to look at the traumas of the past. And as they've moved on and got further away from those, uh, those traumas and become more and more democratic, they've shown more willingness to go back and look and uh, pursue ideas of reconciliation. But there's a dichotomy here. And that is how, that is internally, there's a lot of talk, at least in terms of the left-wing governments, in terms of why, how important it is to look at this trauma of the past and address even the authoritarian years and the harm done inside South Korea and how this is so important to move forward that we must first address this. But when it comes to North Korea, almost the opposite happens. That is the idea that they're willing to forgive almost anything or at least move forward without apology. And there's a quote that you put in your article here by um, uh, No Mun Yan, the former president of South Korea, who comes in and he says in 2007, and, and I quote, he has no intention to ask North Korea to apologize for the wrongdoings of the past, including North's invasion of the South. Now, this is entirely different to how they approach uh, Japan, for example. They insist that Japan does apologize first, and without an apology, there cannot be a normalization, just as they insist on the authoritarian regimes in South Korea apologizing for their past and uh, showing some contrition or the country can't move on. So I might care to talk about this strange dichotomy inside South Korea. Well, in fact, uh, to be precise, it was a kind of general understanding of the situation that North Korea is just not going to apologize for anything, period. So, as I mentioned in my chapter, that we have this kind of very paradoxical situation that several times uh, North Korea tried to assassinate uh, uh, South Korean dictators like Park chong or chon tu wan doing it like 1968 and then 70. And then a few years later, Park chong has negotiations with North Korea and they nicely smile each other. And then North Korea tries to blow up Chon Tu Huan in Rangoon. Next year, they have negotiations about economic relations. Then North Korea blows up a South Korean civilian airplane next year. And after, Note Wood tries to engage them. So in a sense, it's a kind of 
acknowledgement that we are simply not able to force North Korea to apologize and we have to like somehow try to take take advantage if they are in a better mood and let's try to ignore what they did before because no chance and in a sense this is indeed a big problem because to reflect on the present situation for example like how the present improvement happened after January 2018 we can see the same pattern that as which I can and summarize a bit like with a sort of metaphor that North Korea used this modus operandi many times and this time lasted. First they punch you in the gut, then when you are gasping uh, for breath and you look really angry, then they suddenly smile at you and if you don't act, then you are the person who don't want, doesn't want reconciliation. So you are expected to my back and forget that they punched you in the gut just two minutes before. So it's really a paradox because South Korea also the US doesn't want to take the responsibility of not using the opportunity of making up and getting a better relationship. But because of this, North Korea can feel safe that whatever we do to you, you are going to make up for it later and we can hold the initiative. It's a kind of very difficult situation because this way they really never have the strong motivation not to behave badly because they feel they can get away with it. So uh, let's move on with that basis in mind to the question of denuclearization. Another article of yours, another chapter here, uh, entitled Given Up the Treasured Sword, the Prospects of North Korea's Denuclearization in Comparative Perspective. And I might get you to start with simply uh, an overview of why nations might do this. Now, there's, off, there's people always say North Korea is after nuclear weapons simply because they want uh, an offensive capability. Some people will say that or a defensive capability. But in the case of countries like uh, China, India, or Pakistan, it's it's often more an important role in terms of you joining this nuclear club and you become, it's a symbol of your technological advancement as a nation. So uh, I might get you to give at least a very over, a small overview and then we might get into just why North Korea might uh, suit some of these models that we're going to touch and uh, why not. Oh, well, it's definitely the case that in many cases, uh, countries develop nuclear weapons for really security purposes, military purposes, but it was not always the case. Like in the case of India, which you mentioned, as some of the Indian scholars like Yogesh Joshi pointed out, in fact, it's very interesting that the development of nuclear weapons was not a direct reaction uh, to the Chinese challenge. It was not integrated with specific military programs. It was not really uh, combined with the development of delivery systems that time. It was more a sort of like attempt to, to show that we, India, a great power, we can do it. So they would create the first nuclear device, which they tested in 74. And then for a long time after, they still did not really develop a delivery system because the point was to to show that we can do it. So in the case of North Korea, it's not so kind of easy thing because they did work on delivery system also very deliberately for a long time before and after. So it's not that, but still, as you said, it's more than uh, just preparing and deterring uh, some sort of nuclear strike from the enemy. Here, for example, I may mention that definitely North Korea had this experience from the first Gulf War, the Desert Storm, when Saddam Hussein had a huge conventional army and still the Americans managed to destroy it in a very short time because of their superiority in the air, their superiority in electronics, in communication system, 
So the North Korea suddenly felt that even though we have a huge force of conventional weapons, thousands of tanks and everything, this may still simply fall apart under this high-tech American onslaught. And even though we can deter that by threatening of like shooting up Seoul and all that, but if it really comes to the serious conflict, probably the conventional weapons are not enough to deter the Americans because we no longer have the USSR and China behind us. So they get got some extra reason to develop nuclear weapons, not only against the nuclear strike capability of the enemy, but also because of the conventional superiority of the other side, increasingly also South Korean side. So there's also another question here, and this goes back to just what we were talking about before, the idea of North Korea struggling in many ways to revise its own history. And in 2012, in May 2012, uh, the North Korea's uh, own constitution was revised to declare itself a, quote, nuclear state. So that might, simply based on what we've discussed before, offer a new challenge here towards denuclearization, whether or not the leaders might find it appropriate to denuclearize for whatever reason, if this was ever possible. They may, it seems, at least in theory, be pigeonholed simply by them previously declaring themselves as such. Oh, yeah, it's very difficult to revise such a thing. Although, theoretically, whatever they want to explain, they will explain. As we have a saying in Hungary, paper is very patient, you know, you can write whatever on it, the paper will not scream and protest. <laughs> so in this sense, just because it's there in the constitution, it's not such a big problem. But the big problem is rather that, that they developed these nuclear weapons in a very, very public way. They tested them, they showed them to the whole face of the whole world. So after it, uh, to dismantle them would be a, a very, very much a loss of face because they also did a lot of cheating. So to dismantle them in a way that the US and South Korea and Japan is willing to believe that now it's really completely dismantled, this must be done with a very, very intrusive verification system to make it really sure. And which means that basically it would be a sort of like, uh, how to say, unilateral concession to the other side, a sort of like defeat or whatever. So they definitely don't like the idea. It's really something very inconvenient for them and very different from the only other case when a country would completely do denuclearization, South Africa, because South Africa did develop the bombs, six all together, but they did it very secretly. They never did any public test. And when they dismantled them, it was also done secretly. And the world was informed only after everything was finished. Actually, originally they wanted to keep the whole thing secret. So it was easier to avoid a loss of faith. But for North Korea, to develop it first and basically developing something which can North Korea look superior to South Korea because in most other things they are not. Now, this would be really like a big falling down from a high mountain top, and they really don't want this, honestly. I don't say that the negotiations uh, with North Korea over denuclearization is kind of complete waste of time. But I would rather say that it would be like best to fine tune every step in a coordinated way. That if they make a concession, then a proportional concession should be made because either giving up too much or giving too little is kind of counterproductive. So basically then it means that, that the North Koreans themselves can, can decide how far they are willing to go. Okay, if we blew up a kind of testing ground or if we dismantled one or two bombs, 
then you can get this much concession for it. If you give up more, you get more. If you give up nothing, you get nothing. So this way, it, it can be made clear that it's really their decision to keep or not to keep the nuclear weapons and how much of it. Because either if we create the impression that even if they give up everything, we are still going to maintain the pressure on them, definitely then they have absolutely no initiative to give up anything. On the other hand, if they get concessions without making significant denuclearization, then they also get the impression that why should we give up anything because we can still get what we want. Now, before we launch into the South African comparison, because that is so important here, there's some great uh, parallels and some lessons that can come from South Africa here. It is important noting, and you've done this in your research here, of the the odd sort of unique situation that North Korea are in and why South Africa is a great uh, um, applicable uh, example here. Because in most situations in history, when successful denuclearization has occurred, it has happened at an early stage. So it hasn't happened at the stage when they've, like, as you mentioned, just then committed a lot of resources and money and uh, propaganda to it, and certainly not at a point where the, the weapons are already in hand, tested and ready to go. It often happens very early on before they get going. And you mentioned here that in places like uh, Libya, when you do get around to actually denuclearizing these countries, you realize that um, a lot of the equipment that they bought it was sitting there unpacked. They never even got around to using it. And uh, North Korea is not at that stage. They are at a unique situation in the sense they are incredibly advanced and a long way along this particular um, uh, development. Yeah, indeed. And this also raises the question that whether there was a better chance to achieve a deal when the program was still in a very initial stage. That means that when in 1994 the agreed framework was made, whether then it would have been possible to get a better result than now, because now we cannot turn the clock back any longer. But as historians, we can ponder about it. And it's really difficult to manage to know because we would need a lot of really high classified intelligence information to know what stage their uranium enrichment program was that time. Did they ever stop it? Did they keep it going all that time in the 1990s? It's impossible to know at the moment, at least for me. <laughs> but mm -hmm. uh, still, I would think that uh, the fact that the agreed framework was not really implemented by the United States or selectively implemented was they got this heavy fuel oil, but they never got the nuclear power plants. So definitely it was a problem that Congress did not want to ratify the agreed framework. And if the US does not ratify and does not implement it, that really why should North Korea do? So it's really a very serious matter because maybe the analogy is not totally correct, but I heard this interesting argument from other scholars that in the case of Taiwan and South Korea, one reason why these countries were willing to stop their nuclear weapon programs in the 70s, when the US pressured them that they should, that one reason was that they had both of the to both countries, South Korea and Taiwan, they had very big, ambitious civilian nuclear programs, big power plant. They really needed that because after the oil shock, energy was very important for them. And most of this technology, nuclear fuel, came from the US, from big American corporations, General Electric, Westinghouse, all that. Nuclear fuel coming from the US. So if they don't cooperate, in the military sphere, if they resist the US, the US could have shut it down and then the whole civilian program is very badly crippled. They really could not afford that. So the US could use it as a leverage. But if 
we never provide them with a nuclear power plant, then this leverage is basically lost because they can operate it only with the US uh, playing a role. Otherwise, they, it, the power plant can be shut down. So then they would have a stake to like cooperate because otherwise the program is not working. But if the program never starts, they have less reason to cooperate. So my private opinion is that it would have been worse trying to implement the agreement. It doesn't mean it was an absolutely sure case that if it had been implemented, the North Korea would not have cheated because unfortunately they cheat in everything, even in very <laughs> like innocent uh, economic deals. But still, there would have been probably a better chance. Now it's exactly very different. So let's uh, let's dig a bit deeper into this uh, analogy here. So South Africa works so well, and there are a number of of, of key little uh, allusions that you make throughout your writing here that, that seem to sing so closely to the North Korean example here. So um, South the the apartheid regime in South Africa find see themselves as being encircled by communist uh, regimes in the north in countries like Angola um, and Mozambique. Now, of course, it's different in North Korea. The ideology the ideology is flipped. But you can see the analogy there. Uh, there's a whole series of uh, UN-imposed sanctions on on South Korea, on, on uh, South Africa in 1997. And this once again has some analogies to North Korea. Uh, the uh, South African government responds to these this change in environment and these sanctions with their own uh, their own claim to self-determination in the sense that we must build up our own military internally. So suddenly the military budget expands dramatically and they're trying to build up their own forces from inside, realizing they can't rely on the outside world. And also this uh, wonderful thought that, that, that you involve here, that is the idea that the regime in Pretoria were not just um, – were – were growing these nuclear weapons and in some ways they were having the USSR as their ideological enemy here. And of course they never intended to to ever get in a conflict with, with a Soviet Union. They would never have won it of course, but the idea of bringing nuclear weapons into the conflict was useful for South Africa because the prospect of a nuclear war would have brought America in. And once again, this has fantastic um, uh, cross analogies to the North Korean situation today. Oh, well, in a sense, we can argue that North Korea also tried to use the nuclear weapon issue to somehow compensate for the lack of Chinese support after the end of the Cold War, because it was a big problem for them that after 1991, China settles for the policy of treating the two Koreas more or less equally, if possible. Really, China doesn't want to support any of the two Koreas against the other. China keeps saying that we want the two Koreas to be at peace with each other. If China criticizes anybody, it is usually the US. South Korea relatively rarely. South was such a case, but before it usually the Chinese put the blame on the Americans. So in this situation, it's absolutely out of question that China is going to provide North Korea with sophisticated conventional military technology. And for the Chinese, it's kind of like uh, innocent excuse that well. We don't give it to you, but also we don't give it to South Korea. So what's the problem? But then the South, North, Korea, North Koreans can easily say yes, but the Americans provide South Korea with all the sort of equipment. So if you don't give it to us, they still get it from the US. So we are not helped out. So in this situation, that uh, North Korea also tried to build up a nuclear force as a sort of independent uh, power because we cannot rely fully on the so-called ally. But if we think that South Korea felt that if we bring the nuclear issue into the forefront, this will manage 
to activate the Americans to help us out. In the case of China North Korea relationship, it was a bit ambivalent because the Chinese were really very unhappy with the thing that whenever North Korea started working and testing nuclear weapons, the Chinese were really irritated by it. So they last time in 2016, 17, this was very clear. But at the same time, it's also true and that whenever North Korea showed the willingness to tone down the nuclear issue, then it was effective to use it as a car to attract more investment, more economic support from China. So we do can use it as an analogy indeed. So let's uh, flip that over and look at some of the, I suppose, the differences here. There's a wonderful analogy with South Africa, but you also lent, mentioned throughout here some of the limitations that this analogy holds, and that is that inside South Africa, um, at the time, despite having some fears about communist countries to the north, they, their conventional forces were always um, always had the capacity to take care of it by themselves. The nuclear weapons were never really needed in this regard. You also mentioned that, uh, of course, South Africa was never as far along in their nuclear process as North Korea is today. And of course, importantly, in South Africa, when it came when it came around to actually denuclearizing, and you touched on this a little bit earlier, um, they linked it to the collapse of the apartheid regime. That is, nuclear weapons were linked to the regime, and as the regime um, be began to change face and open up and, and be, I suppose, morph into something entirely different, the nuclear weapons didn't matter so much. And therefore, they were willing to get rid of them. And as you said before, willing to get rid of them silently. They just wanted to get rid of all trace of these things so as to not suffer any more embarrassment. But that wouldn't apply, at least in theory, to the North Korean situation. Oh, yes, because definitely there, there is no such a kind of idea that we should dismantle our political system because it is bad. No way. Absolutely no initiative to do anything like that. In South Africa, by like the late 80s, even really a lot of conservative politicians, even within the National Intelligence Service and elsewhere, rather hopeless politicians and military leaders, they realized that this cannot be continued forever, that eventually we must some find some way out. And what is really like, really very much uh, surprising, I myself cannot give an easy answer, answer to it, that because it's really very much a psychological matter and I would need to go there and interview people about <laughs> it. How on earth it was possible for the national party leaders like the clerk and others to trust basically enough the ANC leaders and others like Nelson Mandela and other politicians that we can let these people to form a government and we won't end up like those, you know, French Piet Noirs in Algeria who were thrown out of the country. So then it's not simply we hand out, hand over power in a kind of peaceful way that they will honor the agreement for one year or so, but then it will never really turn so bad for us that we basically should vote with our feet. So, so I must have really cannot easily explain this. I would need to <laughs> go to South Africa <laughs> to find out. But it's absolutely sure that North Korea does not have any kind of illusions about the fate of its leaders, that if we ever give up power, something bad is going to happen to us, either from the domestic North Korean population or from South Korea or from the US, but they really don't trust their life uh, to the hand of anybody else. Well, let me ask you another psychological question then and uh, see how you go with this one. Though it does border a lot on uh, the elements of history as well. That is, if we move away from South Africa for a second and look at uh, South Korea. And uh, I wonder how you think of the presence of, for so many years, of nuclear weapons inside South Korea, how this may have affected 
North Korea's own commitment to achieving them. There are moments in history where where countries have acquired nuclear weapons simply as a kind of arms race, as India and Pakistan, India and China, Soviet Union. Uh, these kind of countries were very closely aware of what their neighbors were doing, and therefore they were racing in a sense to do it. So I wonder how you see the North Korean situation, whether they a lot of their development of these weapons was it in some way a race with the South, because South Koreans had them in their country from 1958 to 1991, as I mentioned. But also throughout this period, they were fallen terribly behind, as you mentioned, in the technological arms race. Nuclear weapons aside, they, they were getting dr to terribly outpaced by uh, South Korea in terms of what South Korea were able to develop in terms of military technology. Yeah, I think it's, it's absolutely true, because the presence of nuclear weapons in South Korea definitely influenced them in many ways from the very beginning. They really felt that this is something to which they have to react in one way or other. There was a time in 1960s when they thought that if they conduct irregular warfare in South Korea, then this is a kind of uh, a kind of feasible reaction because the US really cannot use nuclear weapons against guerrillas, you know, it's impossible. So this way we can hit selected targets, including the president, and we can somehow, instead of neutralizing the American nuclear weapons, just avoiding that. But uh, this strategy simply did not work because there was no popular basis for a guerrilla movement here at all. So this event got them back to the question that how to offset this nuclear weapon capability. They also tried this approach that if we build tunnels under the DMZ, then we can mix with for our forces with the enemy forces and then the Americans are not going to use nuclear weapons because this would kill their own troops and South Korean troops. But still then the US can strike Pyongyang or whatever. So I think that it did affect their mentality in many ways. But it's also interesting that when the U.S. finally withdrew its nuclear weapons in 1991, and this was announced by Notevu, by the South Korean president, still, actually, the North Korean nuclear crisis erupted not long after, when it became clear that they don't want to show all their facilities to the Atomic Energy Agency. So... So it did not make such a positive effect on their behavior as you would expect. So with a, let's uh, twist this slightly and uh, have a more modern look at this and try to finish this off with another article that you've, that you've written here, North Korea's peace offensive at whose cost? Now, this is a little bit shorter than the last one and uh, I suppose just as well considering the time we're at here. But let's look at a lot of these issues and see how they reverberate now into the present moment. And let's begin with um, the, uh, the idea that we mentioned quite a lot throughout this podcast, that this uh, reach from North Korea south, the even ideas that we, are, uh, that we are looking for some sort of reconciliation, is just a Trojan horse to insert yourself between South Korea and America and separate the alliance. And um, as people would know, when, um, when the, after the, the year of testing in, in, in in 2017, and when uh, the famous delegation came down for the Pyeongchang Olympic Games here, they almost immediately set about enforcing upon South Korea a realization that they'd have to break sanctions. Um, General Kim Yong-chol came down, and of course this person has been subject to, to previous sanctions over the years. He's the person that is blamed for the sinking of the SS Chonan, for example. And uh, I wonder how you viewed this uh, this original reach between the two countries as a first question, and uh, whether or not you think it, there was something more to it, or do you see it in the same sense of the South Korean conservatives as a Trojan horse? Well, there is such an element in it, definitely. Uh, but it, I wouldn't say it's only simply a kind of policy or strategy of division, because uh, for North Korea to completely turn it, 
back to South Korea and having totally no relationship with it at all. It's really not a very good policy, at least not in an economic sense, but also not in a, po- a propaganda sense, because, well, if there is any country which is relatively willing to open its purse and give them economic support, it's probably South Korea, depending, of course, on the administration. So to ignore the possibility of getting economic aid from South Korea, it's not good. Second is that the regime, it's no longer really able to legitimize itself by, you know, the boilerplate communist ideology. It's basically kind of out of fashion any longer. So then they use nationalism as a sort of stronger and more effective form of legitimization. But if it's current nationalism, then it definitely involves some sort of unification and cooperation with the other Korea. So they had definitely some stake of normalizing relationship with South Korea, depending that what they can expect from the new administration that Jongba there in the Blue House. So and I would say it's, I, my op- opinion here is totally like the same like the conservatives whom you quoted, but I do feel that there is such an element in this policy. And uh, there is another element as well that you mentioned that, of course, people uh, who are quite critical or skeptical of the outreach do bring up, and that is the idea that uh, since 2016, the sanctions were beginning to bite Kim Jong-un and that he was re- he's reaching out now simply because he needs a breather of sorts. He needs to somehow ease the sanctions. He's not going to ever give any concessions, at any meaningful concessions. He's just trying to ease some short-term sanctions, get some breath back into his economy, and then continue on. And, of course, part in with this is also the idea is that um, um, they have reached a technolo- technological threshold. And that they need, and they've tested and they've tested, and now they simply need to consolidate, uh, run some more tests. And once they have enough uh, data in the bank and enough uh, development in the bank, they'll begin testing again in a, in a second round. Well, it's difficult to say if they need more tests or not, because the previous tests were at least as much uh, motivated by political considerations as by military ones, that partly you want to show that you are able to do it, but partly you do it to send a kind of message. So in these terms, the patterns of North Korea nuclear testing were actually ironically more similar to that of the big powers like China, like Soviet Union, like the United States, which tested many, many nuclear devices during a rather extended period. And later, later, they started doing it less. India or Pakistan did not do it in such a kind of systematic way. So there is definitely a military motivation uh, to do so many tests. Now it's probably no longer needed, but you know, the problem is with nuclear weapons that theoretically the development never ends. So if you really uh, want to catch up and, or at least keep in the race, then the next level would be, for example, to develop multiple warheads, you know, or something like this, which is now absolutely beyond North Korean capabilities, but to build, for example, a second strike capability to have a nuclear submarine and then launch a missile from there. So definitely this is something which North Korea cannot easily do. But uh, if you want to use simply the technological logic, then they are still in a very primitive stage. <laughs> so. If- <laughs> If they ever get into the idea that we need to develop it even further, they may do it. Just it's too too difficult to do, probably. On the other hand, it's probably also really a political matter that if we 
stop testing for a time, it really sends a kind of message that now we are willing to behave in a decent way. But then there is the dilemma that what to do if uh, the U.S. is not responsive. So this was the paradox they found in themselves in the 1990s, that if uh, the U.S. doesn't comply with the agreed framework, how we can force their hand? If we test a missile, as they did in 1998, then the U.S. will say we broke the agreement. If we don't test anything, the Americans have no motivation to comply because they are not under pressure. So now this issue is again uh, back to the core because now the North Koreans feel the U.S. is not doing what they should. Uh, but if we again test something, then they will say we broke the agreement or whatever. So this is why now North Korea is testing all kind of mess to put some pressure, like this deal with Kesong, this issue with the DMZ excavations, that a bit twisting the arm of South Korea to show that, well, we are unhappy and you should do something about it. But going directly back to testing would be a bit risky, because China wouldn't like it. They are now trying to find some alternative means. Well, that's a, another aspect of this. So let's bring in the the overall regional environment in this. This is a concern that people have in the American administration and in the South Korean right, the, the conservative wing here. That is the idea that Moon Jae-in is uh, in some ways giving away the bank, that he's he's he, he at least in his election campaign bent over backwards to assuage China of his um, uh, willingness. He wouldn't be able to re retract and wind back the installation of these of the Thad missile defense, which is this high altitude American based uh, defense system. But he made all sorts of promises about uh, about how it would be used and how it wouldn't be used in certain ways. And he was bent over backwards for this. And he has been over backwards since to be a mediator between um, America and North Korea. Oh, and he is, as people will notice, he's just spent a significant amount of time in America right now with Donald Trump, trying to fill in this gap and bring the parties back together. While on the other side of this, he seems to have almost uh, found a common enemy with North Korea in Japan. Recently, the relationship between these two countries has been collapsed and the issues of comfort women have come back up. The issues of Dr. and Takashima have come back up. And there's been these odd moments recently where there's even been the occasional military clash. Not so much, nothing uh, kinetic so much, but certain threat of violence and misunderstanding happening here. So how do you see Moon Jae-in in all of this and uh, the role he has been playing? Well, this is, I would start with the issue of Japan because this is really the bigger problem as far as I can see because it's really somehow at least partly, probably more than it's being admitted, partly because of China. Because China was really very angry Angry with the deployment of Saad. And, but to reverse Saad, it would be very risky for South Korea to do. It would be going directly against Trump, and Trump is not a nice, friend, nice enemy, not even a nice friend. So doing that would be really difficult. So in a sense, um, the Moon Jae-in administration picked the weakest resistance, and if we have to make a concession to China at the expense of somebody, then better to do it at the expense of Japan than at the expense of the US. In a sense, it's like kind of safer way to do. But it's definitely a sort of a problem that now the relationship is so bad between Tokyo and Seoul because this is very much good for Beijing, very good for uh, Pyongyang, but not really good either for Korea or for Japan. However, I wouldn't say that this is such a simple situation that the solution would be again to have very close military cooperation between Japan and South Korea. This is what the US administrations always wanted, but this is what China very much doesn't want. It's very interesting that if you look into it, 
China implicitly ag accepts that for South Korea, the U.S. connection is essential. So the South Korea cannot be expected to break with the U.S. The Chinese don't really expect that and don't really try. However, the Chinese consistently resented any sort of Japanese military connection with South Korea, not just recently, long before. It's almost a historical feeling that we have a rivalry over Korea between China and Japan going back to the late 19th century. So if the U.S. manages to bring Japan and South Korea too close together, probably the loss is as much as the gain because the Chinese will get really negative. So this is why personally I felt that it would have been a good idea to try to have a sort of trilateral cooperation between China, Japan, South Korea, because this is not against anybody really. But at the moment, the Chinese are not really for it, to put it mildly. They hate Abe and want to isolate him as much as possible. So in this sense, it is a sort of rational thing, what South Korea is doing. It is also true that doing the exact opposite, that means cooperate with Japan against China, wouldn't be a wise policy. But it's still a problem. On the other hand, uh, speaking about the U.S.-South Korea relationship, well, I would say that here the biggest problem against not exactly South Korean government's policy, but the international image of Trump. This is uh, impossible to avoid because with Obama in the White House, North Korea had a really difficult situation to convince the world that Obama is the bad guy and North Korea is the good guy. It was very, very uphill battle and they never managed to do it. And when they came out with the slogans that he's a black monkey and all that, then they totally shot their own food. But with Trump, well, he has conflicts with almost anybody who comes the way. So no North Korea carry, can very effectively pretend that Trump is the problem and the only problem. It's not even shared responsibility, but Trump is the one who is standing in the way of anything. So it's really a very serious problem because if uh, South Korea tries to solve the issue that, that they want to mediate between Trump and North Korea, and then Trump does tone down his rhetoric and ad adopts a kind of more positive approach, then there is a risk that North Korea feels now we really don't have to do anything. If Trump goes again into a hawkish mood, then North Korea can point at the US and say that, well, you are the problem. And and China is at the moment very much willing to believe it because Trump just pressured them over the trade issue. So they are not very much willing to believe that Trump is the good guy and Kim Jong-un is the bad guy. So as a final question here, I'm going to ask you another slightly psychological point. But it's, the, it's a key that seems to run through everything that we've discussed today. And it sort of ties things up quite nicely. And we've been talking a lot about guilt and memory and ideas of reconciliation and building uh, uh, international relationships of this sort. So I wonder about your thoughts as a broader philosophical and history th and, and historical thought about the ideas of reconciliation and uh, peace commissions and even the idea that sometimes it's important to to disremember these things. So countries like Spain, of course, in the past have, have had these ideas where you simply accept blamers on both sides and now let's just get on with it. And it's a deliberate attempt to to muddy the past so that it doesn't keep effect in the future. And while you're talking about Japan there, what came to my mind was the uh, this is if a country, I wonder how a, a movement like a peace and reconciliation movement can become politicized or and, and how much value you think it might have in the long run because it seems to have something on the face value that, that certainly seems to have a lot of value. But 
Um, if you implement it in a way where you say it's the most important thing that we can have, you have to talk about these things, it, it may be perceived as a political way to attack people. That's certainly how it is beginning to be seen in countries like Japan, these demands for apology. And I, I fear that a country like Japan may look at a country like North Korea. And as you mentioned before, because North Korea are simply not going to apologize and not going to change their ways, and they're going to keep, as you say, punching them in the guts, that the, that the risk, and then as a result, South Korea just get on with it and don't keep laboring the point of apology and reconciliation. You may send a perverse kind of uh, incentive to countries like Japan that the best way to achieve uh, a, a, a future free of the past and free of this memory of the past, as we've been talking about, is simply avoid it, act strong, and be belligerent. Well, it's kind of difficult to summarize it in, in a kind of comprehensive way, but I would mention something about the, specifically the, about the Japanese case, because it's very interesting that there was a chance, there was a possibility in the 1970s that Japan would come forward with a really like uh, strong apology and possibly with compensation to China. They actually kind of offered that, that or at least they tested the, the voters that if this is what China wants. What is interesting, that time when still Mao Zedong was in charge and Zhou Enlai, the Chinese definitely said no. They, we don't want this from you. We really don't insist. Past is past over. What we want from you is what they call anti-hegemonism. That means that you should implicitly side with us against the Soviet Union. Because that time China regarded the USSR like the big problem. So the Japanese resist, resisted that for like six years or more. But then in 78, they more or less gave in. And then they made the peace treaty with China. So the point is that China made the peace treaty with Japan without any demand for apology, compensation, whatever. The past was just written out, excluded from the whole business. Now, what is interesting that this, in my opinion, made the relative worse effect on Japan in this terms of like memory of the war crimes because very interestingly the so-called A-class criminals in Yasukuni which is so much a problem ever since that they were not in Yasukuni before 78 they were kept elsewhere but then exactly in that year they were brought there also other before it only like common soldiers were interred there. So, in my opinion at least, what happened was that the Japanese politicians on the right side, they concluded, okay, the Japanese uh, can make a deal with China without apology, without admitting crimes and whatever, it's not needed. China doesn't want it. Okay, fine. Finally, we are relaxed, off the hook. And then, a few years later, when in like 82, this textbook issue emerged, and then again, when there were Chinese-Japanese disagreements over other issues, again and again, China raised the issue and more and more sharply demanded an apology. And then this is what really made the Japanese more and more uncooperative, that they said, at first, you did not want and now you use it as a stick to hit us over the head, even if we have some other kind of issue. You just want to show that you are the good guy and we are the bad. So then this really made the Japanese increasingly uncooperative. I think it would have been much better to settle this issue in the 70s when China had relatively the best chance to do it, because if Japan does it with China, then it will like follow with the other countries like Korea as well. But unfortunately, this chance was missed. And since that, it became a sort of political weapon, and it's very unfortunate. 
So uh, it's this is such a rich topic where we could go a lot longer and there's so much more to talk about here, but I've kept you much longer than I said I would and you've been very generous with your time here. But um, so the articles that we've been talking about today, I'm going to link below. So these are the ones I used for my specific research for this, for this uh, particular podcast. I do encourage people to go and read them. There is so much in them. And uh, I'm also going to link below to uh, Balaj's uh, books that you can go and find online. So on that, Balaj Shalantai, thanks for coming on the Korean Now podcast. Uh, thank you so much for your invitation. <laughs> Goodbye. 